Let me see. We get into it. I want to just put up the the first verse, first piece of scripture that we had from last week, because it just ties in. That was our uh, scripture last week, and it's a prophetic scripture. It's one of the this look. I I don't know for sure. I I counted one time 333. Old Testament prophecies. Those were clues in the Old Testament that speak about the coming of Messiah. You know, like where he'd be born, who he'd be born to, his suffering, what he would do in his ministry. This is just one of them. So we do know, don't quote me on the 333, that's what I counted, but we don't, we know there's over 300 prophecies. So you got to realize these Jewish people had these prophecies. They didn't have the New Testament. It wasn't written yet. So they had to use these prophecies in order to be able to recognize, you know, looking at the prophecies, yeah, he fits the bill. That's how they were able to recognize Yeshua as the Messiah, right? And this is one of them. It says, I, the I is, is God speaking here in Deuteronomy, not Moses. He says, I will raise up for them, the Jewish people, a prophet like you, he's speaking to Moses, like Moses, from among their kinsmen. So I'm not trying to, look, I don't really, I don't know why God chose the Jewish people. You know, if he, if he chose the Swedish people, I'd be driving a Volvo. All I know is he did. <laughs> That's what I know, right? And they're the chosen people. So based on things he said about them in the Old Testament, when, when, when you're anti-Semitic, you're anti-God. And when you poke your finger in a Jew's eye, you're poking your finger in God's eye. And you got to realize, Satan is incredible at what he does. <laughs> he, he's just the master deceiver. So only he can get people to love Jesus and yet be ambivalent or not love the people he's crazy about. I tell you this all the time, it'd be equivalent to some of you sitting with Bernadette and I and going, you know, I love your husband, I, I really enjoy his teachings, and Bernadette, you're so funny, I love you, but I got to tell you, I'm not crazy about your kids. We're not going to walk away from that and go, okay, I understand. These, these I, I know, I know, we'd go Bronx on them. That's not the point. That's not the point. The, po the point is, you know, it's like today you hear two words that kids are yelling on college campuses, right, about Israel. They're saying, and, and I don't even push this on you. You know this. I don't, I don't push that I'm Jewish. I don't push that I am, but I don't push that. I don't push you to identify. I'm, I'm more Godish than I am Jewish. And, and I'm more into the Word of God than I am into the Talmud. You follow? But there's two words that are being used today constantly. Apartheid and genocide. Apartheid. First of all, the average kid in college doesn't even know the definition of apartheid. Do you know the definition of apartheid? Apartheid by definition is when you have a government in a land and you exclude a whole people group from that government. So in South Africa, it was apartheid because it was a mainly black nation with all white folk in the government. That's called apartheid. Israel's government, 31% of it, almost a third, is Muslim, Palestinian, and Christian. So by definition, Sweet Pea, they can't be apartheid. By definition, that's just a fact. And then genocide, they're killing terrorists. I don't blame them. Do you? Man, you put on six locks on your door, you got a shotgun on the side of your bed, you got a Glock, and you, are you kidding me? And nobody's attacking you. And you're so ready to take somebody out, and you're knocking them for protecting themselves? From the river to the sea, that means wipe out the Jews. The PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, in their charter says we must kill all the Jews. That's genocide. So only Satan could convince people that Israel is doing exactly what the enemy is doing, who they're rooting for.
any decent Bible scholar and any decent Bible teacher knows you got to stand by Israel. Why would you even, what are you getting into politics? What do you know about politics? I watched a debate. To me, it was like two girls in high school <laughs> trying to assault each other. I mean, it was sad. It was like, I saw him first. No, I saw him first. Just tell me what you're going to do. For me, I, I vote as a believer. It doesn't matter. But there ain't no way on God's green earth I'm casting my vote for a party that says it's okay to kill a million kids. If you do that, you got a lot to answer for. Anyway, where was I before you rudely interrupted me? <laughs> I, God, will put my words in his mouth. God says, I'm going to raise up for the Jewish people a prophet among their people. What did Jesus say in John 4, 22? Salvation is of the Jews. It, you can't deny that. It's not like he used to be Jewish and he converted to a Methodist. He's Jewish. And he died Jewish, and he stayed Jewish. And the 12 disciples were Jewish, and they died Jewish, and they stayed Jewish. There's nothing wrong with... Everybody this has this connotation, oh, Jews, bad. According to who? Jews gave you monotheism. Without it, you'd be pagans worshiping polytheists. They gave you the Bible, according to Romans 3, not the Old Testament, and they gave you Jesus. What? As a believer, you don't think those are good things? monotheism the word of god and the messiah and do you know what they had to go through to preserve that i look am i a zionist i'm i'm a goddess and i'm pro god and god's pro israel so by association i'm pro israel it's that simple if you're not i would recommend you start to read the bible some people say, well, I'm neutral. There's no neutrality in the Lord. You can't be a little pregnant. Either are you or not. There's no way to sit on the fence. You're either all in or you're not in. It's extreme. It's an obsession. It's a compulsion. And it's good. I'll put my words in his mouth. He will, this, this prophet, will tell them everything I owe to him. In other words, he's only going to speak what he hears from me. He's never going to speak on his own. He's not going to give his own opinion. He's not going to go, well, I think. Nope. Whoever doesn't listen to my words, God's saying, whoever doesn't listen to my words, because I'm, I'm just going to put him on my lap like a ventriloquist dummy. I'm going, to be, I'm going to speak right through him. I'm going to use him. We'll have to account to himself for me. They're going to have to answer directly to me. Now, the reading that I didn't get to last week, because, you know, we always have once a month, we have an Old Testament reading, and then we try to coincide that with a New Testament reading that kind of dovetails. The New Testament reading was this. I didn't get to it because this was so thick. It's in John, the first chapter, 45, 46 verses, and it says, Philip, who we don't know much about. But that's not important. We don't need to know much about Philip. He's not the issue. Philip found Nathanael, Nathaniel, we don't know much about him, and told him, we found the one that Moshe wrote about. So just stop right there. What is he referring to? The scripture that I just read to you, right? Deuteronomy 18. They were very familiar with the prophecies. They were students of the word. Today, look, 80% of Jews are secular. I bet you that at least 80% of Gentiles are secular, if not way more. They're secular. But back then they weren't secular. They were religious. And they knew the prophecies. And they were waiting for Messiah. They were waiting and waiting and waiting. But trust me, they were looking for him. Philip found, found Nathanael and said, We found the one that Moshe wrote about in the Torah, the Old Testament. Also in the prophets, all the messianic prophecies. It wasn't just referring to Deuteronomy 18. It's Yeshua ben Yosef from Nazareth. Nathaniel answered him, Nazareth? There's always 
right? <laughs> there's always that person. You tell them a hundred right things and you say one thing and they're like, well, what about, there's always that, you know that guy? Can't stand that guy. You know? So cynical. Just so cynical. Doesn't trust anybody. You know why they don't trust, you know why those people don't trust anybody? Because they know they can't even trust themselves. Can anything good come from there? Come and see, Philip said to him. So, Philip Philippos, his name, real name wasn't Philip. I don't want to get technical, but he was so pumped. I mean, here this guy is, this Jewish guy, waiting and waiting and waiting for Messiah, and he found him. Yeah. We get excited when we find our keys, right? Yeah. Woo! Well, you know when you're like, taking a suit to the dry cleaner and you go in and you pull out that 20 bucks and you think you just hit Eureka, you know, like you struck oil. Well, he found the Messiah. That's something to get excited about. If you're born again, what the heck is the frown? Why aren't you excited about being born again? Why aren't you excited about being saved? Your business, your family, I get it. But you should be so much more pumped about being saved. So he's so pumped about finding the Messiah, he had to tell someone. So he's got a buddy, Nathaniel. So he runs, he darts. I told you before, new believers make the best evangelists. It's after we're well studied that we forget what we're supposed to do. We know everything except the main thing. And his message was simple. You know how much I simplify it? Because it is simple. Men complicate the gospel. Men complicate the word of God. Men get involved in subordinate issues and love to argue and stroke their beard. I don't want Yeshua when he comes back finding me inside studying, stroking my beard. And what was his message? We found the Messiah. I mean, they're waiting. They're waiting for years, like over a thousand years, the Jewish people. And what does he say? We found Jesus, who is the son of Joseph. In Judaism, you always, when you call somebody up to read the Torah, like I'd be called up, Yamod, Getzel, and son, Ben, Mayavelvel, you're always called up who you're attached to because we believe, or we used to believe, that based on the way you conduct your life as a person, you can either bring honor or dishonor to your father. And it was very important that you brought honor to your father. So that's how they would just announce people. He could have said Yeshua from Nazareth, but he associated with whose son he is. They knew everybody up there in the Galilee. It was a small area. Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. In actuality, I don't, I, I'm, I mean, come on, some of you are believers way longer than I am. You've probably read John, the Gospel of John, a gazillion times. You've probably read this passage a gazillion times, right? Do you notice it's not accurate? What's not accurate about it? Where's the misinformation? He's not the son of Joseph. Joseph was a stepdad. Right? Technically? Rabbi, are you getting caught up in technicalities? Listen, you better get caught up in technicalities because Satan twists the word of God. So he wasn't totally accurate. Even though he was born of Miriam, she never had been with a man. She didn't know a man. She was a virgin. So he had no human father. Yosef, Joseph adopted him and thus became his legal father, yes. not his real father. Let me tell you something, which I find beautiful. Byrne, check this out. It was never Yeshua's way to hold back men from discipleship on the ground of an incomplete doctrine. Why do we? Okay. It's, it, 
It's like going to a doctor when you're well. It makes no sense. So we then, Yeshua, the Lord doesn't hold us back. Why do we hold men back? Why do we think they have to have everything? Now, now you understand, before you accept the Lord, the Sabbath is Saturday. Why do you do that? Your, your, every doctrine in this room is incomplete. Yep, even you who think you have a complete doctrine. Yours, ma'am, is incomplete. Everybody in here sees through a glass dimly. There are fundamental issues that we have to sign on to. There are subordinate issues which we have to have liberty. But in everything, charity, in everything, charity, everything has to be underwritten in love. Everything. Look at the next verse. Um, John, go to John 146 for a minute. Nathaniel answered him, Nazareth? Can anything good come from Nazareth? What does that mean? I don't know. It's got to mean something. What's it in there for? Nazareth was a despised city. Like the lowlifes came from Nazareth. It was the hood, or, or should I say the hood? There were 2,000 people that lived there in the Galilee. And um, nothing really good came out of there. But do you notice what Philip does? Philip argues. What do you mean? You don't think good people come out of Nazareth? You don't think there's good people? Right? He argued. Did he? Why do we? Because you love to argue, man. You just love to argue. I don't know what's with you. What does he do? He thought the best way to deal with Nathaniel's potential arguments was to introduce him directly to Yeshua. I was recently on the beach in New York and some guy that I made friends with, I made friends with everybody on the block. I just, I knocked on every door and said, hi, I'm Greg, I'm not a creeper. You're gonna see a, you're gonna see a Georgia license plate. You know, it's the only one there in, in the whole 30,000 people, right? So I was on, everybody's name there was Tommy, Jimmy, right? What else? What, what other names we got? Tony, uh, Gennaro. <laughs> so, so I go to the beach and this guy sees me. He says, hey, Greg, come on over. Come on over and sit with us. I got two of my childhood friends here. One's Jewish. I'm like, uh. So... I said, Tommy, I don't, I don't really want to. I'm going to be like a you know, third wheel. And he goes, nah, come on over. So I come over. And the guy, uh, Tommy goes, Greg's a rabbi. And the guy immediately, even though he's secular, he goes, so what seminary did you go to? <laughs> oh, Nathaniel. <laughs> what, what good could come out of the Bronx, right? <laughs> And so uh, I told them, now nah, I, I went to a, a messianic seminary. I, be, I believe that the Messiah has already come and that when he does show a second time and the Jewish people recognize him, I'll be recognizing him, you know, as the second advent. And he goes, oh. Hmm. And he said, you know how many people were killed um, because of religion? And I said, well... Yeah, I, I know about the French war. They killed like 4 million people, a religious war. And the 30 years war in Germany killed one-third of its population. So yeah, there's been tons of, of deaths because of religious wars. And he goes, what do you say about that? I say, did Jesus kill anybody? In fact, it kind of went the other way for him. So he just said, I'm going down to the water. I said, go down to the water. <laughs> Came back out. He went down to the water like four or five times and he really didn't want to go to the water that day. We had a great conversation. I wasn't, you know, you don't have to be arrogant. You shouldn't be difficult. If you're sharing without a loving heart, if, if you don't really care about that person, don't share. Don't do it. You're going to wreck it. You're going to push them further away. 
if you truly don't care about his soul, um, stay away from evangelism. Stay away. The next verse, Yeshua saw Nathanael coming toward him. Sorry for that pause. I just pictured it for a minute and just blows me away. And remarks about him. And this is it's a quotation. So Yeshua is saying this direct. Here's a true son of Israel. Nothing false in him. Meaning this man is a man. It doesn't mean he's ever lied or cheated. This is a righteous man. This is a good man. This is a quality man. This is a Jew's Jew. But it also shows that Yeshua had some supernatural knowledge. Because he didn't know him. But he did know him. And that shows deity. Next verse, I love this section of scriptures. It's not going to be long, don't worry. John 1, uh, let's see. Nathan said, how do you know me? Because he knows he doesn't know him. So how could he say this about him? You know, that's crazy. If a stranger came along and you said, this is a righteous man. This is a good man. You don't know him. Yeshua answered him, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Fig trees give a lot of shade. Give a ton of shade. And a lot of guys back in the first century sat under trees. They didn't have, you know, a lot of chairs around. There was no Starbucks that they could hang out in. They sat under trees and read scripture. Sometimes rabbis would gather their students, four or five people. They didn't have big congregations like this. And, and teach. And there were many, many rabbis with many different students and many different teachings. So Nathaniel thinks to himself, how could you, a total stranger, speak of me like you know me all along? And to boot, he was hidden from sight. Look at the next verse. Look how Yeshua does what he does. Nathaniel said he was a rabbi. Believe it or not, he was a teacher. He was a rabbi. He was a Jewish guy. He was a rabbi, and he had students. Rabbi. You are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Look, he recognized him as the Messiah, which is a big deal. Because one moment he's saying, what good could come out of Nazareth? He's still coming out. And then in the next moment he's saying, you're the king of Israel. You're the one we've been waiting for. You're the one Moses spoke about. You're the prophet. This is my take. You can have your take. You're, you're entitled. Maybe it was the power of Yeshua seeing him when he was shut off from human sight that convinced him. Maybe that blew him away. How can you see me? But he did. Maybe the knowledge of Yeshua being the Messiah was given to him from up above. Maybe it was divine. Divine revelation. It happens. I don't know. But what I do know is that he now knew that Yeshua was the Messiah. The greatest revelation ever. Look at the next verse, 150. Yeshua answered him, you believe all this, quote, you believe all this just because I told you I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than that. He's just beginning his ministry. So Yeshua in this verse is making two references to Nathanael that he was the Messiah. One, he described his character. Two, he had seen Nathanael when no eyes could see him. These two proofs were enough for Nathanael to believe. But now the Lord promises even greater proofs than these. Look at the next verse. This is the kicker. Then he said to him, this is Yeshua talking to Nathanael. Yes, indeed. I tell you that you will see heaven opened and the angels of God going up and down on the Son of Man. Yeshua is referring to himself like some kind of conduit, some kind of mediator, some kind of connection. He's referring to himself like a ladder. Remember? Jacob saw a ladder. 
going from earth to heaven and he saw the angels ascending and descending and this he called this the stairway to heaven not led zeppelin's version of course and it was connecting heaven on earth listen heaven is god's domain this is not god's domain god's over it but god's in heaven even the heavens of heaven we don't belong in heaven we didn't come from heaven we have no way to go to heaven we're on earth how can you connect a god in heaven with men on earth you need a god man you need somebody that can make the connection between god in heaven and man on earth this is my take nathaniel's under that fig tree and he's reading a torah portion and the portion he's reading is about jacob's ladder and he knows this is the only connection that's why i called it bethel the house of god and then jesus comes along and says hey nate i'm the ladder This yes indeed appears 25 times in the Gospels. The word in Hebrew is amen. It's something that's said at the beginning of a discourse in Judaism, meaning, listen up, I'm about to drop a buttload of truth on you. And it is crucial that you hear what I'm about to say. It was translated from Hebrew to Greek, from Greek to Latin, from Latin to English. It has become a universal word. Amen is a universal word. And it's the best known word in human speech. He made an apparent reference here to Jacob's dream. Yeshua was giving Nathaniel a picture in time in the future when he would come back again and reign over the earth. In that day, when Yeshua reigns, heaven will open. The favor of God will rest upon him as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And Jerusalem will be his capital. I do believe that Jacob was meditating on, I mean that Nathanael was meditating on Jacob's story about the latter. That ladder with its ascending and descending angels, which represent communication from heaven to earth. It's a picture of Messiah himself. When Yeshua reigns as king, these angels will travel back and forth between heaven and earth, fulfilling his will. Yeshua was saying to Nathaniel that he had seen only a very minor demonstration of his messiahship, the tip of the iceberg. In his future reign, he would see Yeshua revealed as God's anointed son. Then all mankind, Jew and Gentile alike, will know that something good did in fact come out of Nazareth. So were my Jewish brethren looking for Messiah in the first century? Of course they were. Of course they were. Just as many are looking for Messiah today, they just don't know it. So why did so many miss him? When people say all the Jews, I, I don't even know how they could say that. <laughs> I'm very careful. They go, well, the Jews missed him. Did they? The 12 disciples were Jewish. Stephen was Jewish. Paul was Jewish. The thousands of Jews mentioned in Acts 21 were Jewish. There were like a million Jews who believed in the first century. I don't know where people get this concept from. It's not taught in the Bible. I don't know if they're listening to somebody who's misinformed. But so many did miss him. And the question is why? If we had those prophecies and they were waiting and they knew the scriptures, why weren't they able to identify Yeshua as the Messiah? Well, like I said earlier, prophecy doesn't describe the future in the same detail that history describes the past. You gotta be a real good student of the scriptures, guys. I, I, I really, this is gonna sound arrogant. Please take the arrogance out of me. Christians today in churches are treated like five-year-olds. 
Mormons, Jehovah Witnesses, Buddhists, they know the scriptures way better than, way better than Christians. N nobody's teaching in the church, even in the Messiah community. A rabbi, pastor, how do I study scripture? Come to our Bible study. I don't want to come to your Bible study. What do you mean you don't want? Well, well how, did, how did they get the first interpretive Bible? Didn't that person need the scriptures? And didn't they need maybe a concordance? And didn't they need the Holy Spirit? Where did they get the revelation from? I don't want your revelation. I want to study the scriptures. Why are they taught? In seminary, they're taught. In seminary, they're taught how to study the scriptures. Then why don't they teach the people to study? Because maybe they, they'll be able to study and they won't need you as much. Oh. Oh. No. I might have a few less people coming. I'm not coming back here, Rabbi. Who cares? Take your 20 bucks, go now. <laughs> Play to an audience of one, man. Yes. Nobody's going to judge you except for the Lord. Yes. Good, bad, or indifferent. Didn't you learn already? Some of you are older than me. People come and go. Yes. Yeshua always stays. You gotta take a little literal approach to the scriptures. Is everything literal? No. There's there's simile, there's metaphor, there's mixed metaphor, there's symbolism, there's figurative language. But until you figure that out, you gotta take when it says don't murder, you know what it means? Don't murder. When it says don't lie, you know what it means? Stop lying. It's simple. You must use Scripture to prove Scripture. Don't give me a verse and talk for 45 minutes. Thread the needle. Show it to me in the Torah. Show it to me in the prophets. Let me see it in the Gospels. Let me see it in the book of Revelation. Come on. Three, if there's any apparent discrepancies, and there's 969 in the Bible, if they're apparent, you've got to reconcile them. Four, when it comes to prophecy, there's the law of double reference. And five, context, 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 context. Don't read out of context. So that's the first reason why. A lot of them just didn't understand the prophecies. But more importantly, I think, you got to realize the Jews were tired of the persecution. They were persecuted in Egypt. They were persecuted in Babylon. They were persecuted by the Medes. They were persecuted by the Persians. They were persecuted by the Greeks. In current, they've been persecuted by the Romans. They're tired. They're tired of being beaten. They're tired of being beaten. They've been enslaved since like 1200 BC. They just wanted the Messiah to come and set up his kingdom and kick the snot out of their enemies. That's what they wanted. They were looking forward to the golden age of the Messiah's reign. So they were looking for a conquering king, not a suffering servant. They wanted the line of Judah, therefore they missed the Lamb of God. The big mistake and the big mistake that my people still make is they weren't understanding that there'd be two advents, two appearings, two appearances of Messiah. First, he would come as Yeshua ben Yosef. Yes, the suffering servant described magnificently by the prophet Isaiah. Then in the end days, he would come as Yeshua ben David, the king, the conquering king spoken by the prophet Zechariah. They just didn't see it. Maybe they didn't want to see it. Maybe they just wanted a king. So here's my question before we split. Would Messiah be the suffering servant of Isaiah 53 or the royal king of Zechariah 14? He'd be both. Yeah. He'd be both. He would arrive first as the Lamb of God, to be given up as an innocent victim, an innocent victim to die as a substitute. Sin can't be brushed under the rug. Guys, you can't brush any of your sin under the rug. You might overlook it or think, ah, it's a little thing. No. 
No. All sin has to be paid for. Either you got to pay, maybe I'll, listen, if you got a mortgage and, and, you know, you're having a difficult time financially, maybe we'll pay a month for two months, three months. I don't know. But somebody's got to pay it. Otherwise, they're foreclosing. Right. You don't pay for the sin. You're getting foreclosed. Yeah. Why do you think we wrote the book? Why do you think we're going nuts? Why, we just, we just, we're doing two audio books now for people who don't want to read, one in English, one in Spanish. I found out there's a ton, a ton of blind people out there. So we're going to do one in Braille. Charlie wrote to me and he said, well, we had 156,000 books distributed. I said, text me when we have a million. There has to be a substitute. In Judaism, it's Zobach. The whole sacrificial system, when they brought these innocent animals and the animals didn't do anything, little innocent sheep, and they laid their hands on them. What were they doing? They were letting God know this transfer to this one. And they had to slit the throat. What you, a lot of you guys are dog owners, dog lovers, right? Some of you, it's a little creepy. But anyway, <laughs> you know what I mean. When you, when you put the dog in the stroller, you lost your mind. Okay? Ma'am, if that's you, I mean, you, you don't need Jesus the king. You need Jesus the therapist at that point. <laughs> but can you imagine bringing your animal in? And you got to slit the dog's throat. And your kid says, what are you doing, Mom? Mom sins. Somebody's got to pay. Sin is costly. That's why only the Son of God could have paid the price. A zobach, an innocent victim. But then he would come a second time. As, as the glorious king. He's come, listen. Zechariah says, all eyes will be on Israel. Nobody knew Israel exists. Now everybody's in Israel's business. Everybody. Aborigines in Australia are saying, apartheid. What, you can't even speak English. <laughs> all eyes are on her. Because God is setting the stage for the head. This is just, this is just warm-up bands. The headline is coming, man. And he's going to come as the glorious king. Glorious. And he's going to come at the very end of days. Guys, seven years of tribulation. What's the big deal? And the latter part, three and a half years, which is in Matthew 24, read 15 and on, is the latter part, the great tribulation, the time of Jacob's troubles. He's not dealing with you at that point. He's dealing with the Jews. So worst case scenario, you've got three and a half years. Esau, you're going to give up your birthright for some lentils? They better be good lentils. What are you worried about? The, the idea of the second coming should bring joy to you. As a Christian, when somebody goes, you know we're in the last days, you should be like, hallelujah! <laughs> Not, oh, oh. What, what's going to be? What, what am I going to do? You're not going to do nothing. You're going to see such supernatural feats. You think there were big healings in the book of Acts? It was nothing compared to what's coming. The power of God that's coming on you, you've been crying for it. How come we don't see so many miracles? How come we don't see so many? You're going to see them. And God's going to use you to perform them. How cool is that? He's going to fight for Israel as well as to save all those who call him Lord and Messiah. He's coming to save us. We're saved on paper, but he's going to finish, he's going to finish it. He's going to put down all who oppose his rule. He cannot take the throne and have some opposition. And he'll begin his glorious reign, hear it, of peace and security I know we think maybe one of those candidates might bring us peace and security but you're like the lady who pushes her dog in the stroller man
Look, I don't know who your president is, but my king is Yeshua. Righteousness and justice will be the very foundations of his throne. Everything will be right and everything will be just. You have any concept, even if, even if we can conceptualize it, try to. Righteous, everything is so unrighteous. Everything is so disgustingly pathetic. Everything is so evil. Every, every, there's so many deviants who are doing things that are so unheard of. It's evil personified. God has had it. For the very Aren't you tired? Aren't you tired of your kid going away maybe with a couple of girlfriends to Europe as a 19-year-old and worried that some evil mental case is not going to abduct her and put her in a sex slave trade? That was unheard of when I was a kid. The things that are happening now, I'm 65, I never would have even imagined in my wildest imagination. That's happening all the time. For the very, very, very first time since the fall of man, way back in Genesis 3, things are going to start to spiral upwards. Look, things might be spiraling up for you personally, but the world has been spiraling down since Genesis 3. And it's going to continue to spiral down no matter who takes office. And it's only going to... Now, now wait, before you go crazy, vote with your faith. But everything is going to continue to spiral and spiral and spiral until Yeshua touches down with his blessed foot on the Mount of Olives and then all hell is going to break loose and he's going to bury his opposition. As a believer, the second coming of Yeshua is our very blessed hope. You don't have to talk about it all the time, but you better think about it a lot. Guys, it's all about Yeshua. The whole Old Testament, all the roads, all the stories point to Him. All of them point to Him. The New Testament, it's just Yeshua saying, you know all those stories about me? I'm the guy. The letters are just Paul writing, encouraging people to be more like him. Yes. Our faith is so unique. Do you realize if there was no Buddha, you would still have Buddhism? You don't need Buddha to have the tenets of Buddhism. If there was no Joseph Smith, you would still have Mormonism. If there was no Yeshua, you'd have nothing. Like Philip, bring him to Yeshua. Sir, don't tell me about all the hypocrites in the church. Yeah, there's hypocrites in the church. There's hypocrites in the world. You might be one. But I know one who wasn't. And I'm not looking to you, and I'm not telling you to look to me. I lift Yeshua up. I would like to... Leave all the believers in the house, because I know not everybody's a believer, and that's okay. If you're not a believer, keep coming. There's, there's really a, a ton of proof. You know, maybe one of the most ignorant things I've ever heard people say. This, well, there's a lot. You know, somebody told me that artificial intelligence is, is on the horizon. Artificial intelligence has been around for a long time. I met a ton of artificially intelligent people. 
And, and now with the advent of the computer, boy, you spend 10 minutes on Wikipedia University and you're about as artificially intelligent as they come. <laughs> but when people say that, well, it was man who wrote the Bible. Well, it was man who wrote the encyclopedia. It was man who wrote the New England Journal of Medicine. Okay, so how do you know the encyclopedia is accurate? How do you know that article you just read in the New England Journal of Medicine is accurate? Guys, stop acting like an idiot. Any literary document that's written, there are tests for its reliability. Any and every, anybody that's involved with any writing knows this. There's proof for a literary document. And there's only three tests. There's not eight tests, there's not nine tests, three. The first test is what does the document say? Are there discrepancies within the document? That's called internal evidence. Evidence that demands a verdict that the document is accurate. But that's not enough. Then there's external evidence. Besides the document itself, all the names, facts, and figures, are there external evidences that corroborate or support what the document says? Science, archaeology, history, and on and on and on. Then there's bibliography, bibliographical evidence. How many manuscripts do you have written of the original event? And when was the original event taken place from the time the manuscripts were written? Those are the three. I'm here to tell you, prove me wrong, that there's more proof for the Bible as a lit or an authentic, reliable literary document than any book that's ever been written. And that's the truth. That's just the truth. So if you don't read the Bible and believe it, don't read anything. You have no business reading anything. That's the fact. For those of you that are watching that are believers and those of you who are here that are believers, I want to leave you with some encouragement. Think about this. I know I do. If Yeshua, when despised, is hated, and dying, and dead, had the power to reconcile us to God, how much more can He do for us as the living, exalted, triumphant king of all kings and the lord of all lords in other words if his death had the power to save us how much more will his life have the power to keep us don't panic man the best is yet to come. Those disciples who were so close to him in the first century, they were jealous of you and me. We're going to see the second coming. Thus saith the Lord. Let's stand together. As you're standing, I just want to read to you the last two verses for the day. Now, to the one who can keep you from falling and set you without defect and full of joy. You hear that? Full of joy. In the presence of his Shekhinah, to God alone our deliverer, through Yeshua the Messiah, our Lord be glory, majesty, power, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Prince of all peace, Yeshua. The Assemblecha Shalom. God bless you guys. Love you.